Okay. Well, we have the four plaques now. Return all four plaques to the obelisk. Unlock the upper cistern with Dooley's key. Let's do that one first then, because we can gather everybody. Salve, friend. Mine? The golden rule is going to be broken soon. I need you to quietly get everyone except Cynthia's ready to run into the upper cistern when the ground starts to rumble. What? That's a big ask. But something tells me you're not kidding. All right, I'm going to stick my neck out and believe you. But I doubt I'll be able to gather more than a handful of people. Okay, so do we just go to the upper cisterns and talk to Centella, or... Oh, but if Galerius is running around, is he still going to save the people? Because I didn't tell him about the whole resin and being in debt and all sorts of stuff. On your best behavior, I trust? I guess we'll find out. How come you're allowed a weapon and I'm not? Hey, you're not thinking about going into the cistern, are you? Oh my god, shut up, Domitius. I know about your creature, don't worry about me. Well, it's your funeral. Goodbye. And every time we come back... Oh, on the head, it works in one shot. Sorry. Here we go. Didn't get the last one. Centilla, we can do this now. I've gathered everybody, and I have the key. That's the most important thing. You, who are you? Did he send you? I'm Walensius, and nobody sent me. Thank Juno, you're here. You have to help me escape before that monster comes back. I know. We've had this conversation before. We. What? God, am I going out of my mind? Are you going to let me go or not? I've told Galerius to lead everyone here when the Golden Rule is broken, so they can escape too. How did you know? Wait, did you hear that? He's here. He must be coming in through the door behind me. You distract him. Stay right here and keep him talking while I look for something I can use. Oh, but I have the key already. We don't... Oh, what? What did you do with Centilla? Where is she? Maybe the key opened something else here. <sighs> You're human garbage, you know that? So that is how it's going to be. Oh well, this doesn't change anything for me. So, you discovered my secret. So what? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? You're gonna die a painful death for this. Do you really think you can take on a Decurion with that flimsy little bow? I probably could, but I'm gonna let her have this one. Who? Centilla? Where is she? I'm right here, father. Ah! Oh! Ah! Ah! The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. Go. The other should be right behind us. Hey, what's happening to you? That light, it, it's so bright. I thought we needed the key. But Centella kills him anyway. Well, the golden rule does get broken though, so how did they end up surviving that? Killing Centius is a violation of the golden rule. Uh, hi there. Gave me a bit of a fright. Thought I was in here alone. I'm Al. Al Worth? I came in here to find you. Well, here I am. I'm Walensius. Really? It described an event about 2,000 years ago. Someone with your name appeared in the city out of the shrine of Proserpina. Freed an imprisoned woman named Centilla, who then murdered her captor, breaking some kind of ancient law. It said the attack caused golden statues to come alive hunting down everyone in the city. 
and turning them into gold. Apparently, Santilla and a handful of other citizens managed um. to escape, while the stranger disappeared in a flash of light. <laughs> Actually, that was me. Uh, what? So this is the same then, except we got a few more people, I think. Uh. I have the tablet um, let me, God, with your I suicide note. This. It was written by a different I, version of you. I helped Centella kill the man who opened a time portal and drew you back in time, preventing it from ever happening. So you're saying... I get... Maybe we can... It's right here in the cistern. I thought the key opens this thing because normally it's locked, but maybe it opens something else entirely. I'll have to investigate again. Maybe I'll get a different note from Charon. I think that's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna pause here for a moment and make sure nobody else is ever lured into this temple. Good idea. You go on ahead, and I'll be there soon. This ending is different from ending one because we've already climbed up to the upper cistern. In the other one, we couldn't climb up because we didn't have a way to. Or we did, but when we broke the rule, we weren't in the upper cistern. I think that's uh, the biggest difference. So if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be able to climb back up here and make it back to Charon. You're back, but... I found him. He'll be here in a moment. Oh, what a relief. Why don't you tell me what you discovered while we wait? Should we talk about other stuff? I discovered the ruins of an ancient underground city. Really? Sounds amazing. And did you... Oh, look! Here he comes. Oh. Ow! It's so good to see you. You were gone so long I thought I'd never see you again. Kinda lost track of time in there. You wouldn't believe what we found. The ruins of a long-forgotten city. And there was a tablet describing an event 2,000 years ago. Supposedly, the city was destroyed when a woman murdered a tyrant with the help of... Well, my new friend here. I know how crazy that sounds. Maybe not that crazy. That woman. I don't suppose her name was... Centilla? How could you... What? She left a tablet of her own. I stumbled across it while I was waiting here. I think she meant for you to read it. Here, take a look. I don't know what became of you, or if you'll ever read this. But Octavia, Lucretia, Horatius, Equitia and I will never forget you, or what you did for us. It pains us that oh, that's so, so few. many of our dear friends were not so fortunate, including Ulpius and Galerius, who <gasps> heroically tried to rescue Dooley, but never made it back. Oh. But there is no point dwelling on what might have been. All we can do is take this gift you've given us and try to show others the same compassion you showed us. We promise you that saving our lives was not for nothing. Centilla et al. Hmm, only one or two people got saved, not the whole town. Fabia, everybody at the market, Virgil, Georges. Sounds like you meant a lot to her. I'd love to hear your story, but first, you two look exhausted. Why don't you hop in my boat and rest while I ferry you back to civilization? Sounds good to me. And you? Are you ready to go home? All right, Charon. Bury us home. What does that actually mean, though? Because we're dead already. Are you making us alive again, or what? Third ending and the second ending are kind of the same. It's not as big of a difference as this would imply here. <laughs> How many might have survived if you confronted the god of the underworld? More than that, right? Everybody? It's gotta be everybody. Oh, I thought Dooley's key opened this, but no. What about this one, then? Oh! <gasps> what is this? Oh, I know where this goes. It goes to the Great Temple. I see, I see. But that's not that big of a... I guess it's a bit of a shortcut. We don't have to go all the way around. But I actually did want to do one last thing before ending off here. Because I think doing the plaque stuff will be the, um, the very, very end. I want to see what will happen 
if we send the assassin to Maliolus's house. I think he's probably just gonna kill him, but I want to see if Maliolus can talk his way out of it. So, there's one last thing, despite already knowing what the key does. <laughs> it's gone! No more leads! All we've got to do is place the plaques down and... that should be it. Oh, but Galerius... Oh, Fabia's still here. Help! How is this my problem? That's really mean. That's really mean! No! I'm going what? there. This might end up with... Yeah, we might have to do the loop again, but I want to see it. Stop right there. I am looking for Tiberius Quinctius Crispus, otherwise known as Quinctius. Do you know where he is? Yes, he's in the villa, right at the end of this road. He goes by Maliolus now. Thank you. For your service to the Empire, I'll let you live for now. But you'd best make sure our paths don't cross again. Watch the tragedy happen in real time. Tragedy? <laughs> Maliola's dying. Not sure if that qualifies as a tragedy. Probably makes me not a nice person to be saying that. <laughs> but that's why the Golden Rule is so ambiguous. And even Sentius was saying stuff like, We don't care about the rules in the place that you come from. All that matters is what I think, what we think. Well, he says we, but he really means I. What I think is right. Which kind of goes back to the whole thing we were talking about with the Philosopher in the temple. Different sets of rules for one community? Or do we all have our own individual rules? And I don't even... I don't know what the answer to that is. How do we decide what's right and wrong? I don't know. Maybe every day, on an everyday basis, we just think certain things are right and wrong because that's what people around them, the community, has generally accepted. And that's why we have stuff like courts. So we can decide on individual cases. Salve. There's just no hard and fast rule about this whole system. What now? I'm here for Maliolus. Who might you be? The name's Domitius. You want to get to Maliolus, you go through me. Then go through you, I shall. Okay. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. Alright, sorry guys. Finish the job. It's okay. I'll make it all right. This is the last time. It'll happen. What is Cynthia screaming about? I wonder if it's possible to lure the people into killing Sentius. Maybe not. Alright, hurry up. I wanna kick him. Okay, with any luck, this should be the last loop. Which, I think we should just tell Galerius to save the people then. Forget about running Some around. Friend. Well, save everybody. You oh! Hmm. We can do that quickly too. But then... Yeah, okay. Rufius. All right. Tell Maliolus you know his real name is Quinctius, thanks to Claudia, and that Nero sends his regards. Then tell him to withdraw from the election and release his debt bondsman. What? Are you... You're serious, aren't you? I doubt Domitius will let me talk to him, but I'll make sure he passes on the message. That's it! Now go! As fast as you can! I'll go, but once I'm done, I'll need you to tell me how you know all of this. Yeah, I want to tell you too. I think we can do it this time. Come 
on, come on. We still gotta make the big trek up to the upper temple. But now we know we can unlock that door and go directly into the upper cistern. Which... We could unlock it beforehand. Whoa, Alpheus is already here! Good man, good man. Don't take your own life. We can fix this. Oh, I wish we could save everybody else here. But I don't think I can. Yeah, Cynthia's is key. Only he has it. Sisyphus. And now that Ulpius is gone, I can look at this area without being interrupted. Alright, ready? These four names should be the same person. Kabash shouldn't even get mad, because... It's the same god, just in different languages. Pluto. Here we go. Oh god. Pluto. But it's all his name. Pluto, father of riches, grant me an audience. Would any of them have worked? This has been going on for far too long. Hades, Lord of Many, grant me an audience. Oh, I have to do it according to the... The decorations? This is Egyptian. I wasn't really doing it on purpose. Osiris, Lord of Silence, grant me an audience. The first two were a fluke. I just accidentally did it in the right order. That Sumerian dress. Nergal, the Fierce One, grant me an audience. Okay, this is probably the white hallway that was mentioned in the very beginning. So, as per the devs' request, spoiler warning! There are spoilers beyond this point. What the hell? What? Wait, this is electronic! On Earth? What? The hell? Oh my god. Proserpina? Well, th there's multiples of these things, though. What? And here you are. Allow me to introduce myself. As you have already gathered, I've been known by many names. Nergal to the Sumerians, Osiris to the Egyptians, Hades to the Greeks, and Pluto to the Romans. But the one constant through it all has been my title. God of the Underworld. And I've been watching you with curiosity, mortal ever since your arrival. You are unlike the others, aren't you? And what is more, 
You carry a weapon that was never intended for mortals to wield, and you do it so brazenly. But there will be time for your reckoning later. First, as a reward for undoing the desecration of my obelisk, I will allow you to satisfy your curiosity. Ask what you will. <laughs> what do you think about the Golden Rule? <laughs> What's your story? My story is many thousands of years long. You will need to be more specific. What do you wish to know? You're a god? It is a matter of perspective. God is a label I was given by you mortals, not one I gave myself. Your ancestors revered me because to them, my knowledge and technology made me incomprehensibly powerful, just as you might seem so to an insect. But despite all that, there are rules even I must obey. Technology. Why do you look and sound like a man? My kin and I all adopted this form long ago, so that we might better understand and communicate with your kind. In time, we grew fond of the sensory delights it affords. Desire, joy, ecstasy, even rage and sorrow, while an acquired taste can be addictive. Is he missing some teeth? He kind of looks like Rufius, actually. May I see your true form? No. Long ago, I swore to Persephone that I would remain in this form for as long as we remained among your kind. I must honor that. Who is the woman to your left? This is my beloved. Proserpina. Like me, she has been known by many names. Eresh Kigel to the Sumerians, Isis to the Egyptians, Persephone to the Greeks, and Proserpina to the Romans. Or perhaps you might know her as the goddess of springtime, the cycle of life and renewal. Your gaze lingers too long. Who is that on your right? That is my servant. You would have met by the river, though she wears many faces and goes by many names. Charon. Kumutabal to the Sumerians, Kirti to the Egyptians, Charon to the Greeks, and Charon to the Romans. Her role is to ferry souls between the mortal world and this one, and to make their transition as seamless as possible. For that, she earned herself the infamous, if erroneous, moniker, the Ferryman. You will talk more later. For now, ask your questions. What do you want from me? Why am I here? How do I stop you, more importantly? It's so strange because he's talking about all these civilizations that we know to be from the past, but he's sitting on some sort of a sci-fi throne. And we're in some sort of a sci-fi spaceship hub thingy right now, looking at Earth. Let's talk about something else. As you wish. It's like the white hallway transported us out of that world. What is this place? It has come to be known simply as the Underworld. And it exists because of a wager I made long ago. What was the wager you made? That is a long story. One that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day. You see, long ago, my kin and I set out from our home on Elysium to search for other forms of life among the stars. We discovered your planet and witnessed your kind evolving from primates into something lawless and barbaric. You all but destroyed yourselves, your two short lives being extinguished by violence and ignorance and disease. Yet Proserpina saw raw potential in you and persuaded the rest of us it would be squandered without our intervention and stewardship. So we revealed ourselves to your people in a place called Sumer. We offered guidance in agriculture, toolcraft, and law, and you called us gods. For a time, you flourished, but soon you were too many for us to oversee. And as you spread from that cradle of civilization, we saw something disturbing. We had sown the seeds of dependency and confusion, and soon you returned to your old ways of violence and ignorance, this time in our name. My kin had seen enough, 
and gave up on your kind, condemning you as barbaric and chaotic, scarcely more than animals. We began preparations to return to Elysium, our home world, a utopia unspoilt by conflict and unimaginable in its beauty. But my Proserpina could not bear to abandon your kind without guidance, and knowing it would force the rest of us to leave her behind, she made an extraordinary sacrifice. She gave up her immortality to descend permanently to the ranks of humankind. And so she began her inescapable trajectory toward death. Horrified, I acted swiftly. I placed her in suspended animation in a deep frozen sleep oh. to prevent age and sickness from claiming her. And then I pleaded with Proserpina's father, who the Romans called Jupiter, to bring her with us Zeus? to Elysium. It was and is my hope that once there, we might one day learn to undo what she has done to herself. But he refused. I did everything I could to persuade him, but he would not relent. He would rigidly uphold his final pronouncement. Humans were unworthy of ascension to Elysium, and no exceptions would be made. But seeing that I was aggrieved, he proposed a wager, the terms of which were as follows. If even one human city could prove itself capable of living without sin for a single year, then Proserpina and all of humanity would be permitted to join us in Elysium. My part would be to remain behind, the last of my kind, to watch over you without interfering and to sit in silent judgment. And so my reward has been to languish here, enduring a 3,000 year winter, waiting for the day your kind proves itself worthy of her faith in you, so that I might take her with me to Elysium and unthaw my goddess of springtime. And here I am, after all this time, still waiting. We've been sinning for 3,000 years straight because your rules are barbaric. It's not made to be really followed. You're, you don't know enough about us. No, we can't have a perfect system here. Who are your kin? There were also gods who, like me, have been known by many names. But perhaps you knew them by their Roman names. Our leader, Jupiter, as well as Neptune, Saturn, Juno, Minerva, Mars, Venus, Apollo, Diana, Vulcan, Vesta, Ceres, and of course, my beloved Persephone. Who built the city? As the first wave of your kind arrived from Sumer, I had them build a city in their own fashion so that they might be comfortable and recreate their lives here. I had them build the entrance as a vertical shaft leading to baths to cleanse them of the sins of their former lives and to prevent escape. I watched wave after wave of Sumerians arrive, and as their civilization declined over the centuries, they were replaced by Egyptians. Of course, believing themselves to be the superior civilization, the Egyptians promptly built over what had been built before and made all the same mistakes. After another thousand years, the Greeks began to arrive, and then the Romans, and they all did the same thing. They built upon the underworlds of their predecessors, renamed their gods, and ensured their foundations were forgotten. How did you decide who comes here? To ensure the wage was fair, it was important that my subjects were chosen at random. To this end, I had my servant distribute a thousand tokens fashioned from silver, a rare element at the time, across all of Sumer. Whoever died while in possession of one of them would be located by my servant and ferried to this place, with no memory of how they arrived. As the tokens were discovered, they were traded, smelted, and fashioned into trinkets, and eventually coins, spreading to Egypt like seeds on the wind. Later, when they spread to Greece, they would come to be known as Charon's Obel, or as coins for the ferrymen. Some placed coins in the mouths of their dead, hoping they would awaken here, though they had no way of knowing which coins were fashioned from the original tokens. In fact, 
Almost all of the tokens are accounted for. Only two remain. And so after this wave destroys itself, as it is destined to do, your kind will have squandered the last of its potential to ascend beyond this rock and Persephone's along with it. You make it sound like we actually want to ascend your so-called Elysium. If you're telling me it's gonna be a place where we can't even say I'm gonna kill you without intending to go through the action, then I don't want to be there. <laughs> the two coins, me and Al. But Al, I don't even know if that counts as not having been used yet because Al... Al killed himself outside the ruins. I don't know what's the distinction between the outside and the inside then. I guess the time? Because right now it's like 2000... I mean, in the beginning it was the present and then we went in the loop. And that's 2000 years in the past. Hmm. How did humans learn about the underworld? It is a regrettable story. One of the first men who came to this place was a king of Sumer and a troublemaker. To be rid of him, I returned him to his people on the condition that my servant erased his memories of this place. But the erasure did not take completely, and he told stories of this place as if describing memories of a dream. His tales were committed to writing, which came to be known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Oh, wow. His words were twisted and distorted over generations. Later, the Egyptians would adapt Sumer's stories of the underworld, making them wildly intricate and labyrinthine. Their Book of the Dead and Book of Gates bore less and less resemblance to this place in their priests' pursuit of profit. Then, when the Greeks began to arrive, they proved far more cunning. And in a series of incidents that will not be repeated, five of them escaped. A warrior named Heracles, two kings named Sisyphus and Theseus, a poet named Orpheus, and a Trojan named Aeneas. They each told embellished tales of this place, how to get here, and how to escape. And so from Sumer to Egypt, Greece to Rome, your kind has always told each other stories about this place, though each story contained only a seed of truth. He's even saying that the myths that we know today were started by him. Hmm. Of course. You're so kind to indulge my curiosity. Are you responsible for the Golden Rule? That is merely the name your people have given to it, but yes, it is my doing. See, now we know that it's not for the collective good. That's why there's collective punishment. All he cares about is if someone sins, then this whole batch of people don't matter anymore and he's got to wipe them all out and start fresh again. To try to have us supposedly live without sin for a full year. Why turn people into gold? That is a story dating back to the very first wave. After the Sumerians finished building their city, the self-declared ruler threw a banquet to celebrate. Now this man was unmarried and many women were vying to become his wife prestigious position of power and influence in a new world. Of all the women, two were particularly ambitious. Both were beautiful, and both arrived at the banquet wearing eye-catching dresses and painted faces, their hair woven in elaborate fashion. The first woman, recognizing that she would require an advantage to win the ruler's affection, draped herself in jewelry ornate necklaces, bracelets, and rings fashioned from gold. Seeing this ostentatious display, the second woman grew envious, for she had no such jewelry at her disposal. She prayed aloud to any gods that would listen to cover her in gold, and when her prayer went unanswered, she took matters into her own hands. While the others indulged at the banquet, the second woman summoned the first for a discussion in a quiet place. She checked that nobody was watching and pushed her rival from the top of the ziggurat where she broke her neck on the rocks below. But I was watching, and I decided to answer her prayer. I took the golden bow left behind by Diana, and I shot that woman in the heart, covering her from head to toe in a layer of molten gold. And I left her to stand there, 
that she might serve as a grim reminder of what befalls those who sin in my domain. But that was not enough, for the entire city was tainted by her sin, and the wager could no longer be won. So I had no choice but to wipe the slate clean. I gilded them all to make way for a new wave, and began the wager again. And to this day, each of them, and all who came after, line the halls of this city, inanimate but conscious. Suspended in time with only their sight and hearing preserved, so they may bear witness to and lament the folly of your kind for eternity as silent golden sentinels. That's cruel. So you're responsible for destroying all these lives? No, he's gonna say that they destroy their own lives. I give your kind a second chance at life, as well as ample warning about my law. And when you disobey, and you always disobey, you force my hand, bringing terrible suffering upon yourselves. And so you ask if I am the one destroying your lives. And I say, no, you destroy yourselves. I <laughs> am merely the means by which you do it. Where did these golden bows come from? When my kin departed, they left behind many relics which I inherited. A consolation prize of sorts. The golden bow originally belonged to one of my kin, who the Romans called Diana. As my collection of golden statues grew, I chose the most ferocious among them and equipped them each with a duplicate of her bow and tasked them with hunting down the Forsaken at my behest. They became known simply as Furies. Okay, hold on. Sure, we're talking about the Golden Rule now, but the whole mechanic of being able to go back in time, was that something you intended as well? Because that doesn't seem likely. What do you consider a sin? I've always considered that the cornerstone of morality is the ability to determine right from wrong on one's own. No attempt to lay out rules like your Code of Hammurabi or your Twelve Tables of the Roman Republic can ever cover all possible scenarios. This should come as no surprise to you, since the core principle has been expressed in many forms by many of your civilizations. The Egyptians made a rudimentary attempt with do to the doer to make him do. The Greeks refined it with avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. The Roman Stoics added, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Even the so-called cultists hiding among you often say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is the simplest of concepts, and each one of you is born with the faculties required to apply it to any situation. Yet none of the peoples who expressed this rule were able to uphold it. Curious, is it not? More curious that some things that are definitely immoral you don't consider sinful. That's the people like Decius taking advantage of the entire system. You don't care about those. You only care about the people who supposedly sin because of your rules. That principle is not as easy to apply as it sounds. <laughs> For you, perhaps. How do you know when people sin? I'm able to commune with all of the statues in the city. Their ears are my ears, and their eyes are my eyes. Is Proserpina connected to the statues in the same way? If she was still conscious, I suppose she could, but she's not. Why do you ask? She's frozen. Does this guy have canine teeth, or what's going on with his mouth? No reason. Then what an odd question. Shh, don't let him suspect. I've seen some terrible things here that you didn't consider a sin. How could you let them happen? Do you plan to speak in sweeping generalizations? Or are you going to give me an example? Like literally everything? Yeah. Suicide. I've seen no such thing, but in any case... What?! Taking one's own life is a self-directed act. Oh, I see. It is not one that is done to others, however they may be affected by it. Therefore, it cannot be said that one who commits suicide has done anything unto others. He hasn't seen it because this time we saved Ulpius. So he doesn't seem to be aware of the looping stuff then. Ah, 
unto others. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do unto you. That seems like an extremely literal interpretation of the rule. Applying this rule always requires us to interpret the meaning of the words. A literal interpretation helps to minimize the ambiguities of your primitive language. If our language is full of ambiguity, doesn't that make the rule inherently subjective and unreliable? Hmm... Supposing you are right, then my law has been broken, and I should turn you all to gold immediately. Is that what you want? Okay, now you're just saying that because I'm beating you at your own game. I'm right, and you know it! Then your desire to be right outweighs your desire to survive. You will make a fine statue. Hmm. Looks like we messed up here. But what's gonna happen if I draw the golden bow as opposed to the wooden one? Guess I'll try the bow, the golden one. <laughs> Do you really think you can wound me, a god, with that primitive weapon? Let's find out, shall we? Pathetic. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. one. Oh god, give me that. Okay, I don't know what you're doing. Oh. Uh... Impossible. Oh god, whoa, she's like broken into pieces, dude. Oh! Hi, y'all. Impossible. Are they trying to kill me at the same time, or...? Sentius? Right as we were dying, there was an objective going to Sentius, so it seemed like I was supposed to go through the loop again, which I don't think is feasible after we've gone through this door. I was right, okay? I was right, but this guy's all like, Okay, well, if you're right, do you just want to die? And then he just cut the conversation short. I've seen some terrible things here that you didn't consider a sin. How could you let them happen? Do you plan to speak in sweeping generalizations? Or are you going to give me an example? Suicide. I've seen no such thing, but in any case... Taking one's own life is- I'm gonna do the exact same thing here, but I guess we gotta back out and be like, Well, okay, I wanna live. The blind. No, of course not. Never mind. Huh. Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? A scam. Ah, the tavern keeper, yes? How is that inconsistent with the rule? Because they're trying to gain profit and money and better standing in society via means that are not considered moral. She wouldn't want someone else to sell her hemlock if she thought she was buying a means of escape. I disagree. Having watched that tavern keeper, that is precisely what she would expect from others. She would view it as a game, one she intends to win. You can't know what she would expect. You're just speculating. Applying this rule always requires speculation to some degree. It requires us to ask what another person would want if they found themselves in another situation. Which means it's inherently not black and white then, because speculation can... You can't guarantee that speculation is correct. Yeah, exactly! Doesn't that make it inherently subjective and unreliable? Not if we're wise enough to know the mind of man. And you think you know the minds of other people? Hmm... Supposing you are right, then my law has been broken, and I should turn you all to gold immediately. Is that what you want? See, every time I get an upper hand on him, this is all he says. Huh. Now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? Because he's a god and humans are just not... We're just plebs to him. Debt bondage. You speak of the moneylender. How is that inconsistent with the rule? He wouldn't want to be trapped in a 30-year labor contract because of a loan. And he would never have signed a contract pledging his labor for 30 years. 
All he did was enforce the terms of a contract signed voluntarily by others. Okay, that is actually bullshit. Because Maliolus is rich. He has a villa. Of course he would never sign a contract. Does Opius have a villa? Does Yulia have a villa? Are they rich? The whole concept of debt bondage, like slavery, is unethical. It's illegal under international law where I'm from. Ignoring your irritating sense of moral superiority. This is interesting. I'm curious, how do people escape poverty where you're from? He doesn't know where we're from. Yeah, he doesn't know about the time loop stuff. He's just the god responsible for stuff happening 2,000 years ago somehow. And then in, in present day, all we know is that supposedly whatever has been happening stopped because there's no, there's no current city in current day. There's just ruins. It's customary to take out a loan to buy a house and in some places pay for an education. I see. And how long might it take such a person to repay their debt? Okay, you can't use America as a standard. <laughs> it depends. Typically decades. Sometimes their entire life. I fail to see how your system of loans is significantly different to a debt bondsman signing over his labor for 30 years. Why is it different? Well, for one, we weren't tricked into it. Because Maliola sort of tricked them into it, right? But mm, it's not being a slave. Although <laughs> this might be social commentary on like American capitalism and stuff. <laughs> okay. Mm, what if I just say it? It's not the same thing. Hmm. Supposing you're right, then my law has been broken and I should turn you all to gold immediately. What do you want? That one was a little bit hard to rebuke though. Huh. Now tell me. What other sins do you believe I have overlooked? But when you're a slave, you have to listen to the, the person who owns you. But in, in our present time, if you borrow, if you take out a loan from the bank, you can get a job elsewhere. You don't have to be forced to work at the bank. Although I'm not sure if that's a positive or negative difference. You still have freedom. You can go places. Experiments on the golden statues. The midwife in the palace, yes. How is that inconsistent with the rule? She wouldn't want to be experimented upon if she was gilded. The rule is do unto others, meaning other people. Those statues are something else now. Bloodless shadows, mere shapes of their what former the selves. They are forsaken. What happens to them is no concern of mine. Your arbitrary definition of what counts as a person. Applying this rule always requires oh my goodness. us to interpret the meaning of the word. Hmm. Huh. Now tell me. Abduction. How are you telling me that this is not black and white? Abduction? You mean the magistrate imprisoning his daughter in the cistern, I take it. He did so because she sought to escape. A sin I take particularly seriously. Better that he stops her from escaping, albeit brutishly, than I have to wipe out this entire city to punish her. Wouldn't you agree? I feel like a logician would tear this guy to pieces. First of all, why is escaping a sin? Because you made it a sin, arbitrarily, for the purposes of your stupid wager. That's why. Why is escaping a sin? It's not. I disagree with that. Hmm. Supposing oh you're right, God. then my law has been broken. Fine, you say whatever you want, then. <laughs> now tell me, what other sins do you believe I have overlooked? This is anger-inducing. It's no wonder people say that gods are cruel. This just shows how unreliable and subjective your moral code is. You're no better at judging right from wrong than any human. Do you honestly think you could do better? No, but that's my point. Nobody's grasp of right and wrong is so perfect. They can be trusted with all this power. You've become a tyrant. I should strike you down for that. And if you did, you'd be proving my point. Hmm. Now, did you have any other questions before your reckoning? Very well. What do you have for me? It's all the questions I had. Good. Then now it is time for your reckoning. Only, it seems, something is wrong. It has long been within my power to see into the hearts of mortals and weigh their deeds in life. But, when I peer into you, I see only a blank slate. 
as if you did not exist until you appeared in this city. How is this possible? Charon, where did you find this one? I do not remember ferrying you. How did you come here? Maybe it's Charon from 2000 years ago? Maybe you're getting forgetful in your old age. You would have us believe that my servant merely forgot bringing you here. Then why don't you know where I came from? But he can kill me at any time, so fine, fine. If you kill me, you'll never find out how I came here. Is that really what you want? Is that really what you want? Okay, let's calm down a little bit here. <laughs> I misspoke. I arrive here in about 2,000 years. If that is true, then I sense the intervention of someone powerful. How did you come to be in this time, mortal? Who brought you here? He cannot know. So I guess Proserpina is the one who did it, somehow. Hmm. Proserpina and Charon? I was hoping you could tell me. I do not know. My kin departed long ago, and Proserpina slumbered for 3,000 years. Shouldn't you know this as the god of the underworld? Tread lightly, mortal. Enough of this. It seems I will need to put your reckoning on hold for now. But answer this. Why have you come here? What is it you seek? We couldn't kill him with a golden bow, but I, I mean, I never tried a wooden bow. <laughs> I'd like you to put an end to the golden rule. <laughs> your hubris is amusing, so I will allow you to make your case. But I warn you, if you anger me or waste my time with lies or wrong-headed arguments, you face death here. So, tell me, why should I put an end to the so-called golden rule? If you're doing this for love, you should know that Proserpina doesn't love you. No. How can you expect us to live without sin if you can't do it yourself? The Golden Rule is corrupting the city, and it's ensuring you'll never win the wager. Yeah, that's true, too, because inherently having the system is making people behave in a certain way. It's not natural. Then again, I mean, living in any sort of community is not natural by that standard. How can you expect us to live without sin if you can't do it yourself? That is a very serious accusation, mortal. What sin have I committed? What evidence do you have to support it? Hello, your wife next to you? Okay, you've given terrible pun- Okay, if you say this one, I don't know, man. I do think it was an abduction, right? This is what Equitia said before. This- not this one, because I think people- he's gonna say, people came here on purpose. And this one might be true. But who did he punish who didn't commit a sin? There are people who have sinned who have not been punished for committing a sin. But are there people who didn't commit a sin who was punished? Not in the golden rule sort of way. Stuff like Yulia and Ulpius wanting to commit suicide. Like, that's a punishment, but that's not a golden rule punishment. Didn't you abduct Proserpina and imprison her here? Hmm. I am well aware of the story told by the Greeks and Romans of my so-called abduction. It is entirely unfair. My love was dying, and I intervened the only way I could to save her life. What would you have done? The way he talks is so... childish. It's unfair that you accuse me of this. But didn't she choose to die? It was an act of rebellion against the others. She knew I would have to act to save her. And I did, because I loved her. I love her still. Accordingly, I reject your argument. You get to say whatever then, because you just... <sighs> Should we try it? I feel like you're, you're just gonna say whatever you want anyway. Mm, let's see some other arguments. 
very well. I don't want to talk about the Proserpina stuff. No, I think I'm gonna... Um... Hmm. Okay, this is what appeals to him. Because if we get through this way, he might be like, Oh, well, maybe we gotta change it then, because I do want to win the wager. The golden rule is corrupting the city, and ensuring you'll never win the wager. How so? And be specific. You have made a grave allegation, and I expect you to back it up. But he's already said that he doesn't consider Aurelia's thing a... a sin. But, um... This one might be the worst? Maliolus has trapped people in debt bondage by convincing them that rebelling would break your law. His cruelty does seem to grow greater by the day. Rufius has become so paranoid that he's jumping at shadows, like Virgil's sexuality. He is a volatile and confused fellow, that one. Aurelia's exploiting people's desperation to escape by selling them hemlock. I admit, I have grown disturbed watching her. It's all the examples I can think of. Pathetic. You will need to do a lot better than that. That's three examples, man. Okay, let's try this one again. Uh, I don't want to talk about Proserpina, though. She said don't bring her up, and I'm obviously not going to attack him. That is a very serious accusation, Mort. You've trapped people in the city against their will. These people were all dead when my servant found them. I gave them a second chance at life. Would you prefer to have simply ceased to exist? They might have. They might have. Maybe? Then you still have the option to end your life should you wish. <laughs> and you are no worse off than if I had not intervened. Accordingly, I reject your argument. You've given terrible punishments to hundreds of people, some for minor sins and some who committed no sins at all. Every one of those people was guilty of failing to ensure their peers lived virtuously. They failed collectively, and so they were punished collectively. The Romans understand this, as did the Greeks before them. Why are we responsible for the actions of others? Okay, talking about... this is not... I don't think this is concrete enough. That's just basically saying that we have different cultures. If our positions were reversed, you wouldn't want me to punish you for the sins of other people. Ah, but I am a god, and you are a mortal. Why would you expect me to treat you as I treat my own kind? You are not a peer. You are not a respected equal. Let me ask you this. Do you treat insects as you wish to be treated? Do you care for their well-being as you would your fellow man? Do you ensure they have food and shelter and protection from predators? Do you give them rights? Okay. To your question, I would say no. Okay, yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is a lie. No. Of course not. Because that would be absurd. Just as it would be absurd for me to treat your kind as equals. The rules for thee, not for me. Oh! Oh, Ooh, this is hitting below the belt a little bit. <laughs> mm, do I want to bring it up, though? Oh, this is so enticing. Let's do it, do it. I think this one might be safer, but this is too enticing. <laughs> your kind and mine can't be so different, given that you're in love with one of us. My love for her does not mean I am not superior, now that she is mortal. <laughs> What makes your kind superior to mine? Where to begin? Our lifespans exceed yours by thousands of years, in which time we accumulate vast wisdom and a mastery of technology you cannot begin to imagine. Lifespan? So you're not immortal then? It would be most unwise to get ideas about attacking me. Hey, I was thinking earlier, because when we were attacking him, he said impossible. Maybe I just have to shoot him a few more times. Hmm... Why does wisdom and technology make you superior? Because that is the source of our power over you. So you think you're not obliged to treat us fairly, because you're more powerful than us? Hmm, you could say that. 
What was it that the Roman Stoic said? Treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you? My kin have no superiors. Okay, now you're just being literal. But didn't you say Jupiter was your leader? There is a hierarchy within your kin. Hmm, that is true. Go on. So are you treating humans the way you would wish Jupiter to treat you? Make your point, mortal. You are not treating humans like the way you would wish Jupiter to treat you. The end. I'm saying, if you can't follow your own rule, how can you expect humans to? Let me ponder that for a moment. If you are right, then it would follow that all this time, I have been in the wrong. But, no. The very thought of it aggrieves me. How can I accept your argument, when doing so would make me a tyrant and a monster? Oh, that is a very human thing. Not accepting your wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly! You're not a monster. You're a human, and you made a mistake. Wait, what? What are you saying? Humans make mistakes. It's in our nature. You have spoken eloquently. And yet, if what you say is true, it follows that my wager was fatally flawed from the beginning. But that would mean Jupiter, Preservator's father, who knew more about you than anyone, proposed a wager I could never win. Why would he do that? He didn't want you to go to Elysium, dude. You and Proserpina and all humans. That's a little bit heartbreaking. We might break his little heart. <laughs> mm. I feel like Jupiter probably did it on purpose, though. But maybe he made a mistake, too. That's possible. Perhaps he made a mistake, too. A mistake? But he is the best and greatest of us. Perhaps when you took on a human form, you took on some human foibles as well. Uh, your words sting me, mortal. But perhaps it is what I deserve. As difficult as this is to admit, I have suspected as much for a long time now. And I cannot deny it any longer. I've been so fixated on taking my beloved to Elysium but every time one of you sinned, it wore away my hope of being with her again. In time, I began to despise your kind for making her believe that you could ever be better than you are. But my rage was not born of malice, quite the opposite. Everything I have done, I did because I loved her. Who knew this empathy of yours, which you celebrate so much, could have such a dark underside? This has gone on too long. It is time for me to let go of this form, of her, of all of you. But know this, if I abandon the way Journey for Elysium, neither she nor your kind may ever ascend. We just want to return to the world. Hmm. Very well. I will have Charon make arrangements to ferry the others. But as for you, be aware you will be separated from the rest. Two thousand years of time separates us. Why? Once this exodus begins, the events that brought you to this moment will never have taken place, and you will have created a paradox. What will become of you is difficult to predict, but that is the risk you have taken by interfering in the natural flow of time. Now, are you ready? Hopefully I'll still be born. I'm ready. Farewell, mortal. Wait, so where are we after all? What is a sci-fi place? It's just the underworld. Oh, we're going backwards. 